Hey, welcome to Rock Paints Models. In today's video, we're going to be painting Magor's Fiends of Warhammer Underworlds. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of the whole red and gold look for corn stuff. So I decided to paint these guys with some black trim rather than gold trim, and I think it turned out quite nice. Now I'm starting out here with the Evil Sun Scarlet, and I'm applying this through an airbrush over a black prime. The black prime is important because I'm actually using this very thin and I'm feathering my airbrush so that I'm applying a very small amount of paint at once, building up a kind of transition and gradient. So I'm using the natural transparency of the red paint in order to be able to actually create a transition from the black through to the red. So the red is going in the brightest spot where I want the, high, the brightest parts of the armor, and I'm leaving it almost black right in the undersides. As you can see, this uh, builds up quite quickly. It's much faster than painting red over black by hand. Um, and uh, you end up with a much smoother paint job as well. You can do this by hand. If you do, you can be much more precise with it and you only need to paint the red paint in the actual armor areas where you want it to be red. And you'll see why in a moment. So this is what it looks like after the airbrush step. So as you can see, it's very simple airbrush steps, just one color. And I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna paint all of that trim with a bad and black. So as you can see, if you had done this, just by layering or glazing up lots of Evil Sun Scarlet very thinly on the armor panels, you can avoid having to do this entire step. As it is, if you're using an airbrush to do it, you're going to have to do this. It takes a long time. A very long time. It's really, really time consuming to do it this way. And to be honest, I would, if I was going to do it again, I'd probably do it just brush painting it because I think it would get actually a slightly better effect and not take as long so this is one of those instances where using an airbrush wasn't the best choice there you go i'll, I'll, I'll admit when i'm wrong airbrush not the best plan here so this abaddon black has been thinned down with some flow improver uh, winter newton galleria flow improver and water and it goes on about two coats to create a nice solid black color now i'm going to shade all of the red areas with non-oil making sure that it doesn't settle too much on the flat surfaces because I don't want it to pull on the blotchy marks. Just use a clean damp brush to clean that off the flat surfaces, leaving it only in the recesses. And best to do like a section of armor at a time so that you know that you've got it set and you're not gonna wait for gravity to screw up your wash job. Now I'm going to edge highlight all of the trim with Administratum Grey. This isn't thinned down too much, it's just enough to be able to get the paint flowing off the brush uh, nicely here. I'm using a Broken Toad size 1 for this. And you've got to be very careful and mostly use the side of your brush in order to be able to pick out all of those edges. Make sure your highlights are nice and sharp. You can always go back in with some black and tidy up on the black areas quite easily. It's a bit harder on the red areas, but it can be done if necessary. So as you can see, I'm actually edge highlighting every single edge with this. I'm not worrying about whether it's pointing up or pointing down. I'm going to do all of them. Now this edge highlighting step also takes quite a long time because the trim makes up a lot of edges. If you consider that on a regular Space Marine type model, You've got about 45 minutes to, of edge highlighting ahead of you. This guy, or Chaos Guys, with all of this trim, it takes almost double that because you've got the outside edges and the inside edges. So you've got about double the amount of uh, edges to paint when you're doing this on trim. So it is time consuming, it does take a long time. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but it won't look great if you don't. At the very least, do the top facing edges. Now I'm going to use some titanium white, but you can use any white that you've got, a nice opaque white. And I'm using this just to dot all of the corners and all of the rivets and spikes on here. And it makes them look nice and sharp, like they're reflecting a bit more light than everywhere else. So 
the trick here is to just very lightly touch your brush against the point and just straight down and lift it up. No sweeping motions, nothing that you should have enough paint in your brush that just touching it and lifting it up should leave a dot behind. And also if you do screw up, again, you can go back in with some black paint and some administrator gray and tidy it up. It is not that hard to tidy up. It's not that many colors. Now I'm going to edge highlight all of the red armor plates with Cadian Flesh Tone. You could use Fire Dragon Bright as well, which would also look good if you wanted a slightly more saturated look to your red armor. Again, just thin enough so that it's coming off the brush while I'm doing it, on, while I'm using it on the edges, but not so much that it's going to flow off the brush really uncontrolled. But you want it to be nice and opaque, so again, only thin it down a little bit. Do a few tests on the side of the base if necessary. Now we're going to be painting the cloak and I'm going to be starting off over again the black paint and I'm going to be using some thinned down incubi darkness and I'm only painting this on the parts of the cloak that are facing up. So I'm leaving the undersides of these cloak parts in complete darkness. Now if you paint cloaks the way that um, the White Dwarf articles or Warhammer TV tell you how to paint cloaks, they're going to look wrong. And that's because they tell you to wash the cloak and let the wash seep into the recesses and then highlight the raised areas. That's not going to work. You can see what I'm doing here on the screen. I'm just building up these, these layers of uh, Incubi Darkness gradually. This took about half an hour to paint this cloak in total. But if you let a wash define where your shadows are, it's going to only define them where gravity thinks it should go. Gravity and fluid dynamics are a very, very poor substitution for light. So you want to be painting and considering where the light is coming from and what's it going to be obscured by and what's going to be in shadow. So if you want a cloak to look actually accurate, like it's cloak, you need to be painting the topmost folds, the folds that are facing your light source. Don't just paint all of the raised surfaces as you're looking at it, that won't look correct. So now I'm going in with some Cabalite Green. And again, this is quite thinned down, just using some glazes, painting this on the slightly more top facing surfaces, just building it up over that Incubi Darkness. And again, it's gonna take, you know, three or four layers of this, but it's so thin and there's so little paint on my brush at this point, that it dries really, really fast. And if it doesn't dry fast enough, use a hairdryer. That's what I do. So you can see here, just building it up gradually. Again, it took about half an hour to do this one cloak. I think it looked really good at the end of it. Um, and it's only using uh, three different paints. And it's just starting from black and I'm not painting any shadows in at any point. The brush I'm using is actually a size 2, so it's quite a big brush, it's got a decent point and it holds a lot of paint, which is really good for doing these glazing techniques. A few more glazes here. It's always worth, after you pick up the paint with your brush when you're doing glazes, to touch it against a piece of kitchen roll before you start painting with it because that way all of the excess paint, the paint that will just run off and you won't have control over, will just go shoof into the piece of kitchen roll. And you should always do that when you're doing glazes. And it's quite advisable to do it most of the time when you're doing any other color as well, but I have a tendency to just wipe it on the back of my hand when I'm doing any other, any other technique. Glazes though, bit of kitchen roll. It will suck up all of the excess paint that you don't want in your brush. Your brush shouldn't look um, splayed off, spread out, it should hold its point, and I think one description I heard, it should look a bit like a felt tip pen when you've got the correct amount of paint on it. So here we go, that's after all of the glazes, we're just letting it dry now. And now I'm going to go in and do some edge highlights with that Cabalite Green. This is a more opaque version of the Cabalite Green, so it's not thinned down quite as much, 
Again, you can see I'm using a different brush here. I'm using my size one from Broken Toad. And I'm not picking out every single edge or every single raised surface with this. Just the ones that are quite small and need to kind of stand out a bit more from the rest of the folds. So there's basically only two folds where I do that on. That's the ones nearest the shoulders where it's kind of bunched up a little bit. And I'll also go around the actual edges in order to be able to pick those out. Now I'm using some Sybarite Green and I'm just doing some edge highlights with that. Just catching the topmost edges of those uh, previous edge highlights. And uh, doing a few layers on top of the little uh, wrinkles that are in the shoulders there. As you can see I haven't used a wash once on this entire cloak. I won't use washes on cloak. They do not work correctly and they do not give you an actual accurate representation of how the folds behave on a cloak. You can see I also did the front. Again, this whole cloak took me about 25 minutes in total. Now we're gonna base coat all of the Rhinox all of the Rhinox hide with leather. No, all of the leather with Rhinox hide. And again, just a couple of thin coats of this, thinned down just a little bit so that it flows off your brush nicely and you don't get any plumping. I'm also going to base coat the fur patch that's on his cloak at the top there as well. And I'm going to do this over the straps and all of the belts as well. Now I'm going to take some Steel Legion Drab, this is relatively thin, and I'm going to first edge highlight all of the leather areas with this. And then afterwards, I'm going to go in and I'm going to paint some little lines going from kind of about 25 percent 20 percent of the way away from the edges into the boot or the belt and just drawing those back up towards the edge in order to create kind of um, a little bit of a damaged look as long as you've got a sharp brush you should be able to get some nice effects with this just randomly vary the length of your lines and you'll create a good kind of warm leather effect. Now I'm using Karak Stone, and again, I'm doing the same thing. Not quite so much of the actual edge highlights here, but definitely some more of those fine lines. Just trying to get them inside the previous lines that I've drawn using a slightly thinner paint and again make sure there's not too much paint in your brush you can see here that I haven't lost my point the brush isn't shooting off the paint isn't shooting off my brush onto the model it's only coming off my brush when I'm actually applying pressure to it if you don't have control over your paint then these kind of techniques are going to be beyond you and the final step, once all of that is done, is to just wash all of those leather areas with Agrax Earthshade. This just darkens those colours down a bit, kind of gives them a little bit of a waxy look, like they've been polished over and the damage has been, you know, polished up with wax, you know, in the same way that uh, you would with normal leather. For the fur areas, I'm just going to kind of paint some Steel Legion Drab fairly wetly over the fur. This isn't a dry brush, this is just trying to pick up a kind of a pattern in the actual pelt that's going on there. I'm going to use some Karak Stone. I'm going to do that down the kind of middle third or so of the pelt. Again, just trying to create a kind of, a, a kind of stripy pattern with Karak Stone in the middle, then Steel Legion Drab, then Rhinox Hide right at the edges. And I'm going to wash that with Agrax Earthshade and let that dry. Be careful not to get too much of it on your cloak. You can do this before you do the cloak or the other way around. It doesn't really matter which one you do this in. And once that's dry, looks a bit like this. And then we take some Karak Stone and a small dry brush. Make sure we get most of it off on a piece of kitchen roll. And then just very carefully dry brush that over the fur to give us a few little highlights. 
Now you'll note that some uh, paint is falling off my dry brush and landing on the cloak here. And that's fine. Get your big fluffer, and dust it off. It'll usually come straight off. What is corn without skulls? We're going to base coat all of the skulls, and there are many skulls, with this angry dust. This is going to take about two or three coats to cover over black. It's relatively translucent paint, even for a base. But just thin it down, get some nice smooth base coats going, because you want your skulls to not end up with a really rough texture on them. Now wash them all with Agrax Earthshade. Again, you don't want this to pool too much on the flattest areas of the skulls. You want to get it in the eye sockets and in the teeth and anywhere where there's kind of little joints between two different bits of bone. Go back in with Xandri Dust and just tidy it up, kind of re-highlighting back to your base color. Making sure that some of that Agrax Earthshade is still visible. This is a very Warhammer TV kind of way of painting skulls. It's quite time consuming. Um, you can. I've got. I've painted so many skulls on this channel because Games Workshop just loves putting skulls on everything. And I've shown you probably a half dozen different ways to paint skulls and bones so far on this channel. Um, this is by far the most time consuming one, but it doesn't use glazes or wet blending or two brush blending or anything. It's dead simple. So after we've done our. Sandry Dust, we're going to paint some Karak Stone over that. We're just layering it up. Thin down paint, small paintbrush, just building up the highlights to Karak Stone from our Sandry Dust. As you can see, it does result in a nice effect, but you need a lot of layers of thin paint in order to build it up into a good look. Now, this is about a 50 50 mix of Sandry Dust and, not Sandry Dust, of Karak Stone and Titanium White. Again, you can use whatever white that you've got to hand. And we're just going to use this to do a, start doing edge highlights and the kind of the very brightest points on the smooth parts of the skulls. So mostly the foreheads, really. Again, just use lots of thin layers and just build up that transition. I'm never actually taking it all the way up to titanium white, but I am adding a little bit more titanium white into my Karak stone. Each time I go back to the wet palette, just a small amount extra, but never, never all the way to pure titanium white on the skulls. probably spent about an hour and a half painting skulls on this one model. That orc skull took quite a long time because it's a very odd shape. And there were some parts of the straps on there that I kept mistaking for bone and yeah, it's a whole thing. Yeah, the skulls took a long time on this using this technique. I much prefer wet blending skulls, it's much faster to paint them that way. Layering is a time consuming process but it's quite low skill level. Now I'm going to paint all of the skin with African Shadow. Uh, if you're wondering what colour I painted the straps for the skulls, that's just Scrag Brown. Um, yeah, all the skin, base coat with African Shadow. This is a colour from Scale Colour. And uh, it has to be thinned down a fair bit because it's quite a thick paint, these paints. Dries very matte. Otherwise, you know, fine. I'm using pink flesh and I'm mixing that with my African shadow here on my wet palette, you can see. 
create a kind of intermediate tone and I'll be shifting closer towards pink flesh with each successive layer of paint just focusing on the hands you can you can't see me paint the jaw and chin on this guy because the, he, it's completely obscured um, whenever I paint it in the camera shots so yeah sorry you're only going to get to see the hands for this model but this is how I did this guy and one other guy in the warband the other person the other model um, was painted roughly the same but with slightly different colors again just creating a gradient on your palette picking from that and then just layering it up this is all layering technique in this particular area just creating little highlights on the topmost surfaces for the hands and the arms and just building it up gradually 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 now I'm going to take some VGA pale flesh and I'm going to mix that into my gradient to create my lightest point on the model and again this is mostly just being used as kind of not quite an edge highlight but certainly the brightest point of being painted with this and I don't think I go all the way up to VGA pale flesh apart from on a few very sharp points on one of the models who's got little spikes on his forehead which point I use pure on that now it's time for the stomach mouth thing whatever it is this 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 I painted with the airbrush because I was trying to go for a glowing purpley chaos magic energy thing so I'm using some screamer pink here that's thinned down as you can see I'm feathering the airbrush in order to make sure I don't get too much paint out at once and that each layer of paint has time to dry with the air and then I'm going to mix in some VGA pale flesh into my screamer pink here to create a much lighter tone and I'm going to spray this in the middle you want a little bit of overspray on the teeth here it kind of sells the effect it's not necessarily that accurate um, but it looks good and it's much faster than trying to do this with a paintbrush because trying to get a paintbrush inside that mouth is really really hard final color is some white paint and i've cleaned my airbrush out and applied this this is pure white going in here and the problem is that this mouth has a sh cast a shadow on itself so you, you don't get that full kind of glowing from within effect because the mouth always casts a shadow on itself and i didn't really account for that um, but in the final videos it kind of looks okay now you could have done this at the start when you're doing the rest of the airbrushing stage and it would probably be just as easy but you still have to mask off the rest of the stuff that you've done or it would be easier to do this right at the start and then mask the axe head off and do the red but either way I decided to paint the axe heads with an airbrush and I did this with um, some VMA black metal here then I'm creating a gradient with VDMA gun grey. So you can see on the front where it's leaning forwards, I'm actually painting the lower half of the axe and the upper half on the uh, back there. And I'm using VMA steel. And again, this is only going up to about the 50% mark. This is creating a nice kind of gradient in our metallics. You can see the shine changing. And then VMA Chrome, I'm just painting this, I'm kind of overlapping it a little bit on my hand, on the edge of the blade to make it look more sharp. So you can see how it's overlapping on my hand, I'm actually spraying most of the paint onto my hand and then it's just getting a little bit along the edge of the blade. Now I'm using some Drakenhof Nightshade and this is quite low PSI, this is about 15 PSI in my airbrush. And I'm very carefully painting this into the kind of shadowed areas in quotes on the uh, axe head here. This is mostly just to add a bit of color variation and make it look nice. Um, you want to use a little bit less than I'm using here because I, I take it a bit too far on this, but I end up repainting the actual axe head on this particular model in bone. So this mostly applies to the other two guys. Now I'm using Drucci Violet and I'm doing the same thing, just using a little bit less, just overlapping that blue just a bit, just to create a kind of Again, more, more color interest in our metallics here. This is a bit experimental. Now we're using some Methonian camo shade, which to be honest, I'd probably skip if I were you. This, this is what I did, but I'd actually skip this if I was doing it again, because this, at this point it looks kind of nice and magical. And in the end it looks a bit like that. And uh, 
Now we're going to edge highlight all of those metal areas with VMA Chrome. So down the edge of the blade, so you see we overlap the airbrush a little bit, but we still want a nice sharp edge down all of our edges with the VMA Chrome. So I also pick up that um, uh, seam where the bevel is on the axe blade, where the cutting edge is. You want to pick that up with your VMA Chrome as well. Now we're going to paint the rest of the gold slash brass bit with Balthazar Gold. You can see that I've started repainting the axe blade here. That's exactly the same method as using the uh, painting the skulls earlier, just on the axe blade because it's all toothy. So yeah, it's, this is about two thin coats of Balthazar Gold on all of these brass areas. It's mostly on the just the axes, but anywhere where there's a corn symbol, I painted that with Balthazar Gold, and a few of the little tiny skulls that are embellishments on the armor I painted that with Balthazar Gold as well. Make sure each coat of this is very dry before applying the next one, because metallic paints are notorious for clumping, especially Games Workshop's ones. You do not want to have the wet paint lift up the previous layer, otherwise you will get clumping. So now we're going to use a Sycorax Bronze, and this is very close to Balthazar Bronze, but it's a little bit lighter, a little bit more desaturated. We're going to be using this to create our highlight on our axe head here. Now I'm going to wash the entire axe head with my armor wash. The recipe is down in the doobly-doo. You could just use non-oil if you wanted to, if you were that way inclined, or you could also just use Agrax Earthshade. The choice is yours. Pick your poison, as it were. Now I'm just going to paint all of the chain mail with VMA Steel. I'm also going to pick up any other bits of metallics that I haven't painted in a particularly detailed way. For example, on the insides of the uh, gauntlets, there's some little buckles there that I've just painted with VMA steel, and any spikes that are actually going to be metals, I've painted those with VMA steel as well. And then I'm just going to wash all the chain mail and all of those spikes and all of those buckles with non oil. Dead simple. And there we have it. That is part one of Magor's Fiends. Part two, I will be covering the Flesh Hound and the bases for these guys. So stay tuned for that. Patrons will be getting that ooh, very soon if they don't already have it. They might already have it by the time you're seeing this video on YouTube. So thank you to all of my patrons who just escaped off the top of the screen. You can subscribe up there in the top left. You can check out my Patreon. There is a link down down there in the doobly-doo as well. Uh, there's a suggested video on screen, which I would like it if you watched. And you can check me out on the social medias that are all over there. Thanks for watching. Uh, please like, comment, and all of that good stuff. And I'll see you later. Bye.